This module will cover the basic concepts and techniques involved with biosecurity and quarantine. The information in this module is appropriate for anyone involved in amphibian husbandry or field research. The emergence, spread, and devastating impact of Kittredge fungus worldwide has highlighted the importance of paying strict attention to infectious disease when working with both free-ranging and captive amphibians. When talking about biosecurity in this presentation, we are really talking about preventing the transmission of pathogens. Specifically, we want to protect native free-ranging animals from pathogens found in captive animals and vice versa. In this presentation, we will also address protecting captive amphibians from pathogens found in other captive amphibians, particularly when these groups are from different locations. The typical zoological collection is probably the most difficult situation in which to control pathogens. Often these collections will house animals of different taxa from all over the world, all within the same space. This can be problematic because a pathogen that is native to one area of the world may not be pathogenic to amphibians from that habitat, but may cause serious problems for amphibians from other parts of the world. In addition, some species are resistant to some pathogens for unknown reasons whereas others may be very susceptible. Kitchard fungus is the classic example of this situation. Xenopus species tend to be very resistant to disease from this fungus and may be carriers without showing any signs. Whereas other species, such as the Kihasi spray toads from Tanzania, are very susceptible. Inattention to the basic biosecurity principles we will discuss may lead to transmitting chytrid from the xenopus to the spray toads with disastrous results. In this example, it is clear that the xenopus pose a significant risk to the spray toads. However, in most situations, you may not know what pathogen one species may be harboring that could be a problem for another species, so general precautions should apply. The design of your particular biosecurity program will vary depending on what the goals of your program are and what group you are most interested in protecting. We will go over a number of basic practices that should be employed for most captive situations and then discuss practices required for participating in reintroduction projects. The following general categories are important to consider when designing your biosecurity program. Protective clothing including footwear, foot baths, dedicated clothing, and gloves. Husbandry routines can be designed to reduce the risk of pathogen transmission. Equipment and cage furniture may also transmit pathogens and should be treated with this in mind. Water can be a source of pathogens both for your collection and your wastewater can potentially affect free-ranging animals. Food source as well is important to consider. There are a number of facility design aspects that impact the movement of pathogens, including how pest or amphibian proof your building is and other factors, quarantine of incoming animals, and finally necropsy of animals that die in the collection. We'll go over each of these in detail. Dedicated footwear should be used for each amphibian building. These shoes should stay in the building or at the facility and not be used for travel home or in the field. Further protection may be found in using foot baths between amphibian areas. These baths will only be effective, however, if the shoes are made of disinfectable material, if there is little to no organic material like dirt on the shoe or in the bath, and if the baths are changed often. Bleach, Vircon, and F10 are appropriate choices for foot baths. Likewise, there should be dedicated clothing for the facility a separate uniform that is worn and laundered at work is best. As people use their hands to do just about everything, having good hand washing procedures is important. Hands should be washed with soap between working on different enclosures or with different tools. Disposable gloves should be worn when handling animals or cleaning enclosures. These gloves should be changed between enclosures. Gloves should be rinsed before handling amphibians or their water sources. When using gloves, however, it is important to pay close attention to when the gloves are dirty or contaminated and what surfaces are touched with contaminated gloves. This series of images serves to illustrate this last point. In the images, the white powder represents a pathogen such as chytrid fungus or other transmissible disease. Note that this individual is infected. 
The handler is following our advice and using gloves when handling this animal. You can see though that the gloves are now contaminated after touching the infected frog. The handler gets a phone call on his cell phone and so touches his pocket and phone, and then needs to get supplies from the drawer and touches the handle. He now removes his gloves and puts on a new pair in preparation for handling another frog. Before he handles the next animal though, he gets another phone call and needs more supplies from the drawer. These sites, however, are contaminated because they were touched with the contaminated gloves from the previous frog and now the new gloves are also contaminated. He handles the next amphibian. The sunglasses identify this frog as a different animal. And now the pathogen has been transmitted from the first frog to the second, even though the handler changed gloves between animals. The point of this demonstration is that gloves are simply another tool that can be used when trying to prevent the spread of pathogens, but like any tool, need to be used thoughtfully. The organization of the husbandry routine is an important factor in preventing spread of disease. In particular, the order that enclosures are serviced in is key. In general, it is important to service the enclosures from the lowest risk of infection to the highest. For example, enclosures with long-term captives that have been thoroughly tested for infectious diseases should be serviced first. And sick animals, or those in quarantine, serviced last. Additionally, sick or dead animals should be removed promptly and medical care sought or necropsy performed. If separate tools are used, they should be clearly labeled and stored separately for each group of enclosures. The enclosure should be kept as clean as possible. A buildup of organic materials can increase the risk of infectious and parasitic diseases for the amphibians. Tools and cage furniture can be easy ways to transmit pathogens from one tank to the next. Tools should be cleaned and disinfected between enclosures. Ideally, the same set of cage furniture such as logs, plants, and bowls should stay with the same enclosure and not be shared. If cage furniture is shared between enclosures, it should also be thoroughly cleaned and disinfected prior to introduction into a new enclosure. Also, natural materials that could have been exposed to free-ranging amphibians should also be cleaned and disinfected prior to use. Similar to natural materials, water and food sources may be potential vectors for pathogens. Incoming water can be filtered and treated prior to use with amphibians as discussed in the water quality module. Food items that are produced on grounds or in well-run production facilities are probably safest. Feeding wild-caught prey is commonly done and may provide some nutritional advantages. But the harvesting should not be done in areas treated with pesticides or in areas where amphibians are experiencing a disease outbreak, particularly chytrid. Aspects of the facility and enclosure design can also impact biosecurity. Facilities should be both pest and amphibian proof. Flies, roaches, mice, and amphibians can serve to spread pathogens from one area of the facility to the next. Automated husbandry routines can reduce the contact of the keeper with the animals and thus reduce the risk of spreading pathogens. In these examples, water is added through automatic misters, food can be added through a funnel, and water is drained through pipes in the floor of the enclosure. Air handling systems can also transmit pathogens, and some areas of the facility you are trying to keep separate, such as quarantine space, should not share the same air handling system as other areas. Quarantine of animals coming into the collection is very important to reducing the risk to your collection. The risk changes with different factors, including the source of the incoming animals, wild-caught animals are more likely to carry pathogens or parasites that are new to your collection, their history, if there was a recent outbreak of mortality in the sending institution, for example, these animals would be a higher risk than if the sending population has been stable for a long time and what role they will be playing in your collection. For example, if new animals will be going to a building where there are few other amphibians, the risk to your overall collection will be low. Quarantine facilities should be completely separate from the rest of the collection. Ideally, separate staff would care for these animals. If separate staff is not an option, protective clothing and workflow patterns previously discussed should be employed. Quarantine is a stressful time. Animals have recently been transported and may be experiencing a change in their routines. 
While this stress may bring some diseases to the fore that may have been lingering, it is important to minimize the stress. Quarantine enclosures are generally simplistic for ease of cleaning, but should provide all the necessary features the amphibian needs. In other words, the quality of the enclosures and the care provided during quarantine should be just as good as that provided in the animal's permanent enclosures. The minimum recommended quarantine period is 30 days. For animals that pose a higher risk to the collection, a longer period, such as 60 or 90 days, is appropriate. Animals should come into and leave quarantine as a group. This is referred to as all in, all out. If new animals are added to a room during the quarantine, the quarantine period should start over again, as this new animal could pass a pathogen to one of the other animals who could then carry it to the rest of the collection, even though that individual was in quarantine for the specified time. Animals should be eating and acting normally when released from quarantine. If any animals in the group do not appear normal, the group should not be released from quarantine until the problem is diagnosed and corrected. Veterinary examination of animals in quarantine should at a minimum include the following. A review of the animal's history during the quarantine period, such as eating and activity patterns. A physical exam, including assessment of the body condition. Testing and treatment for internal parasites should be performed during quarantine. In most cases, testing and treatment for chytrid is included in the quarantine procedures. Rainavirus testing may be performed, but it is most informative only if there are deaths in the group. Clinical pathology, such as hematology and biochemistries that are routinely performed in other taxa, can be performed in amphibians but interpretation of the results can be difficult, particularly in non-symptomatic individuals. More information about each of these procedures can be found in other modules in this series. Performing post-mortem examination is a critical component to any captive husbandry effort. Knowing why animals die can help fix any leaks you may have with biosecurity and help you make rational adjustments to your husbandry routines. For more information about necropsy techniques, please see the necropsy module. There are many different levels of biosecurity and you can develop your system to suit your needs. The level of attention to biosecurity depends on your level of risk. For example, if all enclosures house relatively long-term captives of common species, the room may be treated as one unit using all the same utensils for the group. In another scenario, there may be different species in each of the three rows from different geographic locations, and so it may be more appropriate to treat each row as a separate unit and try to keep each unit biologically separate from the other, each with its own set of tools, etc. Or, each enclosure can be treated as a separate unit. These decisions will need to be made for each facility, but the principle is the same. Try to prevent potential spread of disease as much as possible in your facility. Most of this presentation has focused on basic biosecurity precautions that should be taken for any amphibian collection. If animals are intended to be reintroduced to the wild, these animals should be maintained in a higher degree of security. In general, these programs should keep reintroduction potentials completely separate from species from other geographic areas. The simplest way to do this is to locate the facility in the amphibian's native geographic area and to house only one species in any one space. If housing the species outside of its normal range, care must be taken to permanently isolate these animals from other amphibians in order to not risk introduction of a new pathogen along with reintroduction of the animals. For more information about setting up permanent isolation facilities, the references listed at the end of the presentation are good sources. Chloramine and chlorhexidine-based products are effective disinfectants. These products are suitable for use on hands, footwear, instruments, and other equipment. The manufacturer's instructions should be followed when preparing these solutions. Bleach at 3 to 6 percent or alcohol at 70 to 100 percent solution can also be effective. Care should be taken with these substances as they can be hazardous. Some equipment may be effectively cleaned using medical standard 70 percent isopropyl alcohol wipes. 
In summary, biosecurity measures can be put into place without great expense, but careful thought about potential disease transfer is required. The most important thing to remember is that anything that touches an amphibian or its enclosure can possibly spread pathogens to other animals. Further resources regarding amphibian biosecurity are listed here. Thank you for your time and attention and good luck with your future amphibian projects.